Where were we? We left off differentiating the upper and lower respiratory systems, differentiating the uh, conduction zone from the respiratory zone, and we were looking at the structures involved in gas exchange. All of this is meant to set us up for the next series of nodes which are on gas exchange. How does gas move? Where, do, where does it move into? What are the structures in the blood that allow for gas exchange to occur? We're not there yet though, we're still in the lungs and we had just taken a more detailed, close look at the alveoli specifically. The grape on that cluster of pods or the cluster of grapes that is the alveolar sac. So all the cells making up the alveolar wall are those type 1 cells. Here's the nucleus, that entire pink area is the cell. The type 2 cells I had just introduced at the end. And the only reason that I wanted to introduce those were because they secrete a really important uh, covering or a liquid, a protein, it's actually a phospholipid, that lines the inside of the alveoli that's really important in maintaining their integrity and preventing them from collapsing. We'll talk about that later today. So this is the terminal endpoint for all air coming into the lungs. It can't go any further. From here, the individual gases can move into the blood, but the air largely is trapped here and will be ventilated back and forth as you breathe. Now, let's connect air in the alveoli with the blood in the circulation. We're going to start to make that connection because we're moving that way as we get through this section and into the next section. We already know a lot of the points that we'll bring up here. Blood supply to the lungs, and I think it's important to differentiate blood that's supplied in order to be oxygenated and blood that's supplied in order to deliver nutrient-rich blood to the tissues, the smooth muscle of the lungs, to help them function properly. And blood enters the lungs to be oxygenated via, as we know already, the pulmonary arteries and the pulmonary circulation. But the bronchial arteries are what deliver oxygen-rich, nutrient-rich blood to smooth muscle. Smooth muscle of the bronchioles and any tissue in the lungs that requires it. The complementary exit points, we know really well the pulmonary circulation. Blood exits by the pulmonary veins, the only veins in the body with oxygenated blood. But the blood that supplies the tissue of the lungs, that allows the tissue to function properly, when I say tissue, I largely mean smooth muscle, but also some of the cartilage and connective tissue, leaves via bronchial veins, bronchial arteries and bronchial veins, arising from the aorta and returning to the inferior vena cava. So draw that distinction. The bronchial or systemic aspect of the circulation is to deliver nutrient-rich blood to the tissue of the lungs, not for it to be oxygenated. But other than this small distinction, blood flow to the lungs seems pretty simple. Deoxygenated blood is circulated through the capillaries that encapsulate the alveoli. Gas exchange occurs magically. We don't know how yet. And then it circulates to the rest of the body. And it would be nice if it worked that way. If uh, air just comes in and deoxygenated blood were oxygenated. If there was just a one-to-one -one relationship. But there isn't. The lungs aren't a singular point. Air doesn't reach one point in the lungs. Blood doesn't reach one point in contact with the air in the lungs. It's not as easy as saying when you ventilate, sorry, when you ventilate, that all of the air will be renewed and can oxygenate blood in close contact with it. Essentially what I'm saying is some areas of the lungs get a fresh supply of air and some don't. 
some capillaries that surround the alveoli see a lot of blood flow and some don't. Ideally, you would want air to go to the alveoli that have blood in the capillaries. Think about it. That makes sense. Those two things need to be there in order for gas exchange to occur. If air goes to alveoli that have little blood flow, then you don't have the opportunity to load blood with oxygen. Little gas exchange occurs. And the opposite is true too. If there's a lot of blood going to an alveolar sac, but it's not being inflated, well, there's no fresh oxygen there. So what I'm describing is what's called the ventilation-perfusion ratio, or ventilation-perfusion coupling. And it is a rather advanced concept. I'm introducing it here so you understand what, I, what it means, but we're not going to talk about uh, zone one, zone two, zone three, respiration. We do get into that in clinical ex -phys in your fourth year, if you want to... Uh, Come and join me there for that class a few years down the road. But just understand that we really want the air coming in and the blood coming in to go to the same place. We would like there to be one-to-one -one matching. How well does air supply match blood flow? If it matches it really well, then ventilation perfusion coupling is good. The ratio is one-to-one. -one. If it's anything else, it's not matching properly. And this happens all the time. With every breath that you're taking now, blood is shunting to different areas of the lungs, different alveolar sacs are opening and closing in an attempt to make this properly coupled. But for the rest of our discussion, we're going to boil down the entire lung as an organ to essentially one point. We're going to think of it as one alveolus, one capillary bed, and we'll consider gas exchange at this single point. We're assuming all the air comes in through the airways and ends up where it needs to be. So how does air move? How does ventilation occur? Like with blood flow, air flow is dependent on pressure gradients. Air also moves from high to low pressures. Air moving from the environment around me into my lungs only happens when the pressure in my lungs is lower than the pressure outside. Air follows that concentra uh, concentration gradient into the body. And then when air leaves the lungs, when I exhale, that only happens because pressure in the lungs is greater than pressure outside. And air follows the pressure gradient out. And so a really nice um, model of what happens in the lungs is shown here. And this, for all intents and purposes, is the thoracic cavity, the bottom of the thoracic cavity, and then the two yellow balloons are the individual lungs. And I think I saw a model like this in the lab. I don't know if you got to use it in lab. But there was a model like this kicking around on one of the shelves that you might have seen. But essentially, what we're looking at here is pulling down on this balloon at the bottom cusp, at the bottom edge, is essentially like the diaphragm lowering during normal quiet breathing. Take a small breath in, the diaphragm contracts, it lowers. <coughs> What that does is it increases the thoracic cavity. The volume in the thoracic cavity goes up. When the volume in the thoracic cavity goes up it means there's a lot more space for all the stuff in the thoracic cavity to, to move around, to expand into. And by increasing volume, by Boyle's law, which we'll talk about shortly, we decrease pressure. Increasing volume of the thoracic cavity decreases thoracic pressure. Pressure lowers, and now all the stuff 
inside the thoracic cavity moves. The lungs, which are very compliant, that means they're malleable, plastic, um, easy to mold, they move easily, they expand into that extra space. So what happens when the lungs expand? The lungs expand, the alveolar sacs expand, the alveoli expand. As those volumes increase, pressure within the airways drops. So now I'm left with low pressure in the alveoli, higher atmospheric pressure outside, if, the, if my airway is not blocked, air will move to equilibrate, to, to bring that back into balance. So pressure outside is unchanged and air moves in along the pressure gradient. And you see that here as the two yellow balloons inflate. You're not forcing air in, it's being passively sucked in because of the lower pressure in the thoracic cavity. So, almost an identical idea to blood flow, following pressure gradients. Low pressure in the thoracic cavity draws air in. This is the same mechanism by which the respiratory pump works. Low thoracic cavity pressure doesn't only draw air in, it also draws blood in. Air just moves a lot more easily, so we can readily observe that change more than we can observe a suction effect on blood. Air, a lot more des uh, dense than liquid, so it moves more readily. So this entire phenomenon, increasing volume to decrease pressure, is Boyle's Law. And movement of air into the lungs, in large part, is due to this phenomenon. That volume and pressure are inversely related. And so we don't have a lung system shown up here. We have a beaker with a plunger, but the exact same thing happens here as would happen in the lung. With more space... There's more room for the contents and pressure decreases. So on the left-hand side, the piston's been pulled up. The space inside has enlarged. There's more room for the contents, whatever the molecules are, to move around. And pressure drops. Volume has increased. Pressure has decreased. They are said to be inversely proportional. And the opposite is true, too. If you make the space smaller, if you compress all the molecules, pressure goes up. <laughs> to connect this with the idea on the last slide, I'll bring that same animation back in, but we have to flip it upside down so that it's a one-to-one -one translation. The diaphragm is essentially the piston in this example. The diaphragm makes the thoracic cavity bigger, makes pressure fall. So Boyle's Law, driving airflow. There are some other factors. This says um, governed in part by Boyle's Law. We always say things like in part or likely or it's possible that as scientists to cover our butts in case we're wrong. But largely, movement of air is due to Boyle's Law. The other small factors would be temperature. Temperature can affect pressure as well, and the lungs are warmer than the air outside. And water vapor pressure. When you bring air in, it's humidified. It's warmed, and it's humidified. And that can affect volume inside the lungs. So there are two other factors that can change uh, or affect volume, but those are fixed. They don't really change on a moment-by-moment -moment basis.
your body temperature doesn't jump to 50 degrees or down to 15 degrees. It's pretty constant. Okay, Boyle's Law. So what are the uh, what are the things, what are the tools that allow Boyle's Law to work in the lungs? This is review from semester number one, the muscles of respiration, the muscles of breathing that are involved in inhalation and exhalation. Here, the diaphragm, by far the most important driving force in ventilation during normal quiet breathing. The plunger that uh, increases and decreases volume in the beaker, or that purple balloon top that changes the size of the thoracic cavity. The diaphragm here is analogous to the piston that illustrates Boyle's Law. And you can see the effect of the diaphragm if you look at rest or during exhalation, the volume in the thoracic cavity is smaller than during inhalation when the diaphragm drops. Diaphragm contracts, it drops, draws lower, pushes down. The volume is bigger, shown here by that sliver of uh, pink, increasing the volume in the thoracic cavity. Now the amount that the diaphragm contracts, the amount that it drops and opens up the thoracic cavity, will dictate how much air moves in. Technically, it'll dictate the pressure change, which then dictates how much air moves in. But you, you understand what I mean. So if I'm sitting here writing notes, maybe paying attention, maybe fighting the nods and trying to stay awake, normal, shallow, quiet breathing, diaphragm might be bringing in 400 to 500 milliliters. It might only move a centimeter. Not much at all. But, as you jump up from your seat and run up the stairs and go for a run later, it could deflect as much as five centimeters, six. More forceful contraction, larger drop in pressure, can bring in two liters of air if, uh, if needed, two to three liters of air. <coughs> Maybe even a little bit more. That's pretty good for the diaphragm itself. Now, this isn't the only muscle of breathing involved in altering the shape of the thoracic cavity. We also saw the intercostal muscles in the first semester. External, internal, and innermost intercostals. Hands in pockets. Hands in armpits show the fiber direction of each of those. Now, these are only minimally active during normal quiet breathing. Contraction of the intercostals might make up a fifth or 20% of the air that moves in. But where these really come into play are during more active breathing. More active, forceful breathing. The external intercostals pick up the ribs below, raise the thoracic cage, raise the ribs, a lot like um, the analogy the book uses is the handle of a bucket. I didn't put the picture up here, but as you pick up the handle of a bucket, it swings outwards. So the ribs swing outwards and up as they're pulled up by the external intercostals. Outward and up, raising the ribs, increasing the thoracic volume. Both of these contribute to inhalation. This would make up the difference between our two or three liters from the diaphragm and then whatever the maximum um, inspiratory capacity would be that you saw in lab and that we'll talk about later. And then exhalation, or the return to normal, you'd think would be contraction of the antagonist muscles, but is normally passive. It's normally quite passive. So instead of engaging the internal and innermost intercostals to bring the ribs down, as you sit there breathing quietly, you simply turn them off 
you simply turn off the intercostal muscles and the ribs will naturally fall back to their resting position, decreasing thoracic volume. Same thing with the diaphragm, by the way. It's a cone or dome shape. It's counterintuitive at first, but as it relaxes, the, uh, the top of the dome uh, springs back up and recoils back to its normal dome shape. And the central tendon you saw last semester was one of the main factors involved in helping that recoil and returning to its normal shape. All reducing the volume in the thoracic cavity, increasing pressure, pushing air out. And through <clears throat> sneaky uh, manipulation of these muscles, you created a trace like this in lab. All the different components of the ventilatory system. Now, I'm really not a fan of the way this trace is laid out. I, I don't often consider this trace starting on the right-hand side and finishing on the left. When you saw with the uh, eye work system in lab, flow or, or volume going up and down, it, it read from left to right like a book would. But if you look at the, uh, the illustration in your book, just be aware. Start of the record, start of the trace is over here, end is over there. And that's only because when we used to use those bell spirometers and they spun, it would spin, I guess, in a way, I don't know if that's clockwise or counterclockwise, but it would spin in a way that the paper moved underneath the needle and the needle made this trace in a reverse orientation, so just be aware of that. And you know well, normal tidal breathing, about 500 mils per breath, pales in comparison, it's a fraction of total lung volume which is a combination of normal tidal breathing, inspiratory reserve capacity, and expiratory reserve capacity. Reserve hopefully making sense. It's what you can tap into above normal, what volume is available up to the maximum in order to increase air in if you so need to. And it's in these types of situations maximum inhalation where you drop the diaphragm eight centimeters and you raise the external intercostals to increase the size of the thoracic cavity as far as it will go. Largest volume possible, biggest pressure difference possible, therefore largest volume in. I get it, it's funny. Largest volume in. Reaching your total lung capacity, your maximum lung capacity. Inspiratory reserve, anything above tidal volume, normal tidal volume. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of extra time talking about all of these other elements. I'll, I'll expect you to know them, and you've done that in lab. You know residual capacity. You know expiratory reserve volume. You know vital capacity. Yeah? Okay, and if you're paying attention, you've noticed that there's the turn it in icon in the top right. I'm going to ask you a question about this now, so make sure you're logged in. It's going to pay to, uh, to always keep an eye out for that icon. What describes the maximum volume of air that can be inhaled above normal tidal breathing? Answer something. Inspiratory reserve volume. Nice job. Did you not see the icon? No? Gotta keep an eye out for that thing. Inspiratory reserve volume. Nice job. Maybe I emphasized it in our discussion for this reason. I don't know. All right, let's finish off with a couple other factors that affect pulmonary ventilation. We'll close up lecture for today. So, so far, muscles contract, volume increases, air moves in. But at the smallest level, there are a bunch of other physical forces that decide whether or not the alveoli are going to inflate and whether air moves to that specific region. And one of those is surface tension. 
surface tension being the, the tendency for the alveoli to collapse. And this is, this is actually one of the passive um, characteristics that helps the lungs return to their normal shape. And that helps you breathe air out, push air out. This surface tension pulls the alveolar walls down on each other. It's an inwardly directed force. There's a layer of fluid inside the alveoli. And if you've ever been walking on the beach and you've had sand stick to your feet, that adhesion between sand and water is analogous to the adhesion between the two walls of the alveolus. The water line in the inside wants to collapse the alveolus. Water's, you'll learn about this in chemistry, water is polar, so it has a slightly positive and slightly negative charge, and it wants to stick together. And that has to be overcome. If we didn't have a way to stop that from happening, it would be really hard to inflate the alveoli. So these never completely collapse because of the actions of uh, surfactant, that product of those type 2 alveolar cells. It prevents collapse of the alveoli. So you can see in this animation, there's, um, you can imagine the, uh, the inside walls being covered in a fluid and the, the the grayish stuff that comes up over top is the surfactant fluid being released over top to prevent collapse. So if we imagine one alveolus here, this is the wall of the alveolus, and there's a water layer on the inside, a fluid layer, and this is the layer that wants to collapse the alveolus or the alveolar sac. sac. There's a force of, of attraction or adhesion that's trying to collapse this inwards. 